Hi folks, and welcome to this short lecture on calculating diluted earnings per share. And we're specifically going to demonstrate the calculation of a diluted earnings per share or diluted EPS uh, with stock options. But first, before we begin to do any calculation at all, let's get a good handle on what diluted EPS really means. Well, diluted earnings per share is a number that tells the people who read the statements if a company had converted any of its options that could be converted into common shares, bonds that were convertible, we've talked about these before, we can convert them to shares, and even preferred shares that we could convert into common shares, what would our earnings per share really be? And if these are convertible, we should find, if we include them in a diluted EPS calculation, that our denominator, which is the wax when we calculate an EPS, should be going up, right? Because in each one of these cases, whether your debt's convertible, it's your options, or your preferred shares are convertible, if you converted them, you'd get an increased wax, would you not? Because you'd have more common shares out there. So therefore, what it really serves to do is communicate what we call the worst case scenarios to the readers of the statement as to what EPS could have been if all of those convertible securities were actually converted into those common shares. So when we do that calculation, it is presented on the income statement just underneath our basic earnings per share. All right, And there are more than just convertibles that can be included in the diluted EPS calculation. We've just talked right now about convertible bonds or debt options and convertible preferred shares. There are all these things called contingently issuable shares, but we'll discuss more of that a little bit later. Right now, I just want to focus on what diluted EPS is and how you calculate it when you've got a dilutive security like options. So that brings us to the next topic. How do you even know if a security is dilutive? How would you know? Well, the security is dilutive if it creates an EPS change that is less than the basic EPS. All right. So if the change in EPS it creates is less than the basic EPS, it's going to be dilutive. Okay. So let's see if we know how to test securities to see if, in fact, they are dilutive. Well, first of all, you have to do a test. Okay. So you have to test every security if it's convertible or can be converted into common shares, you have to test it first of all to see if it's dilutive. All right, And part of your dilution test is going to be this test. Is it going to give you an EPS or the change that it creates in EPS? Is it going to be less than your basic? Okay, So that's part of your test for dilution. And this is a required step. In other words, do not calculate a diluted EPS all right, if you don't know that all the securities you're including in that calculation are in fact dilutive. So you must do a test to see if every convertible bond options, um, uh, convertible preferred shares, uh, all of those things, you need to test each of them for dilution to make sure that they are dilutive before you include them in the diluted EPS calculation. So again, examples of secure, some securities that may be, again, may be dilutive, okay, are options. We've talked a little bit about these before, and that would include warrants, stock options, and share rates. Okay, convertible bonds, convertible preferred shares, and these contingently issuable shares, which we're going to talk a little bit more on later. Okay, so now let's do an example of how you can test um, securities that are convertible into common shares, how you can test them for dilution, and then how to use those diluted uh, dilutive securities to calculate a diluted EPS. So now our example is going to focus on options. So here's a few rules for you. The only options that are dilutive are those that are in the money. In other words, they have an intrinsic value. And how do we know whether or not the options are in the money or have an intrinsic value? Well, we're going to have to compare the exercise price of the options to the market price. And if the exercise price is less than the market price, then people will likely um, it's it's more likely that they will exercise the options because they can buy them for a reduced price, right? Because they'll pay the exercise price and get shares that on the market trade for more, right? People will not, however, exercise their options if the exercise price is greater than the market, all right? And we refer to those options as being underwater, just a term that we use.
So let's do an example now. If we have options, okay, we know the only dilutive ones are the ones that are in the money. So let's see if we can pick out in a question which options we would include if we were doing a diluted EPS calculation. So let's test the options. So let's say a company, branch company, has two kinds of options. Okay, one option type is an option that has an exercise price of $15 a share and the average market price is $18 a share. One other type of option they have has an exercise price of $20 a share, but the average market price is $18 a share. Okay, well, first of all, the uh, market price here is larger than the exercise price, so we know that the options are in the money, so we would consider these to be dilutive, right? But now, if we got to the end of the year and we saw that when we compared our exercise price to the market price, guess what? The market price is bigger than the exercise price. Or sorry, the market price is um, uh, not bigger. It's smaller than the exercise price. So we would consider these to be anti-dilutive. So the point I'm making is that not all options, just because they're convertible into common shares, okay, when the um, person exercises them, not all of them are dilutive, okay? So when we do a diluted EPS calculation at the end of a period, all right, we need to test these securities to see if at the end of that period they're dilutive or not, all right? So for options that are dilutive, and we know this first type of option here, we've said it's dilutive, how can we calculate what the diluted EPS is? Well, we have to be able to compare the basic EPS for that company when we're doing that calculation to what the diluted EPS calculation is with that diluted security in it, that particular option. This option we're not going to include because it's anti-dilutive, right? This guy we're going to consider. So now let's have a look at some of the rules for uh, calculating diluted EPS. Just remember that for any security that's dilutive, it creates an EPS, which is a diluted EPS that's going to be less than the basic. Otherwise, why are we doing it? Right? We're trying to present to our shareholders and prospective shareholders, anybody who reads our statements, the worst case scenario, what EPS would have been if the options, in this case the options that are dilutive, were exercised, right? which is going to increase your wax, which is going to mean that you should have uh, a diluted EPS which is less than basic. So if it's not producing a diluted EPS that's less than basic, guess what? You've included a security in there that's anti-dilutive, right? But we know because we've done the test that this security is going to be dilutive, right? So now let's begin. So we said here we want to um, uh, calculate diluted EPS and we know we've got a diluted EPS uh, number, that's right, when we can see it's less than the basic EPS. So if we have a look at how we calculate basic EPS, this is a formula you should be familiar with from your prerequisite courses, not just our current one, right? Now the issuance of shares for the dilutive option has no impact on the numerator. You should see that. So if we were to, under the what if or the if converted model, if we were to convert these options that are dilutive to common shares, it would have no impact on net income. It would have no impact on preferred shares but it would impact your wax, right? So the change in EPS that this um, uh, dilutive security would have is actually zero. Why? Because you'd have your numerator not affected. It doesn't affect income, doesn't affect preferred shares when you issue more common shares under an option. But it does change your wax because that's what you're doing. You're going to exchange or you're going to uh, convert the options or exercise the options and issue more shares so your wax is going to go up. So in essence there's no change in the numerator. The wax goes up but it's still a zero in the numerator so the change in EPS is going to be zero. Why is that important? Because if the change in EPS is zero i.e. that should be less than your basic EPS, right? So that's another confirmation that the security is dilutive. So that's another part of the test here, right? So when you've got options, you're only looking to include options that are dilutive, right? Which means the exercise price is less than the market price at the date you're doing your EPS calculation. But the other part of it is you need to know what change it makes in EPS, 
okay? And we're going to use this fact, the fact that it has a change in EPS of zero, to prepare what we call a cascade worksheet to present the basic and diluted EPS calculations. So there's lots to know here in this section, lots to know, but it's not hard. None of this is hard, folks. It's just a little tedious and knowing the rules, okay? So now, let's look at how we're going to use this information, okay, to calculate our diluted EPS. Well, the first thing we're going to do, okay, is we're going to calculate our change in wax, right? And to do this, we're going to use what we call the treasury stock method. Now, under the treasury stock method, what does it assume? It assumes that the company is going to use the money that it got from the existing investors, all right, for those dilutive options, it's going to assume that we got that money, even though we didn't, because they haven't necessarily exercised. Remember, we're just playing what if or hypothetical now. What if they converted, right? So we got no actual conversions happening here. No actual options were, convert, were, were exercised to issue shares, all right? But what if they were? We assume that under the Treasury stock method, the company is going to use the money that they get okay, when they're exercised or if they were exercised and go out into the marketplace and actually buy shares at the market price with the money they got, all right? So how do we know at net how many new shares are going to be issued? Let's do a little math. Okay, how much money, okay, would they get? All right, how much money would they get? Well, in our case, I don't know if I said it up here. Yeah, we said that for each option type, okay, assume that there are 5,000 options that allow the investors to buy 5,000 shares. So in other words, we're going to use one option to buy one common share. That doesn't enter into determining whether or not it's dilutive, but it certainly enters into our diluted EPS calculation because that tells us how many new shares would be issued, uh, would be, would be issued if they uh, exercised all of these options, right? So it does have an impact here when we're doing the diluted EPS calculation, eh? So now, if they did, going back, only applying this to our dilutive options here, if they gave us $15, okay, for each, uh, uh, a share, right, they would be giving us $75,000. So they'd give us $15, okay, for 5,000 shares that they're going to get, right? And that would be, they'd be giving us $75,000 to get 5,000 shares, right? But don't forget, we said the company's going to use this $75,000, and then they're going to use it and go into the open market and buy shares at the market price. We said in our question that the market price was 18 bucks a share. So assuming that they would have gone into the marketplace and bought with that $75,000, bought shares at $18 a share, can you see now that they're getting approximately 4,167 shares, which is less than the 5,000 shares they're going to issue? So at net, how many shares um, are you going to need to issue to fulfill the stock options, right? Well, you'd be issuing 5,000 shares, right? But you'd be, to fulfill that, op for, to fulfill that option, right? You'd be repurchasing 4,167 of those shares with the 75,000 your investors give you. So at net, you would be issuing an extra 833 shares, right? That's going to increase your wax, is it not? Because your wax was 100,000. Now you've got 100,833 for your wax, right? So automatically, your numerator, your change in your EPS numerator isn't changing, but certainly your wax is increasing. And we're going to use that fact to calculate our diluted EPS. So when we calculate the diluted EPS, we use what we call a cascade worksheet. This cascade worksheet is produced by the accounting people, and it shows the EPS is what we call a cascade of adjustments to get it from basic to diluted. So now, here's the rule, and this is why knowing up here what your change in EPS is is very important. So even though this is less than your basic and it confirms, it's like a double test, that we've got a dilutive option here, okay, we're going to use this fact 
because there's a rule, and we'll see it more clearly when we've got more than one dilutive uh, security. When showing your diluted EPS in a cascade worksheet, you will always show the most dilutive security first, and that will always be dilutive options. Why? Because it's got the lowest individual EPS impact. You can't go lower than zero, folks. Not when you're calculating a change in your EPS. The numerator here we saw was zero, okay? So we need to know when we test our securities that they're dilutive. For options, we know, we've always said, that when they're in the money, they're dilutive. But we also need to make sure that when we do the test, the change in EPS is zero. We need to prove that fact because this tells us that the options will always be the most dilutive because they'll have, as we said here, okay, the lowest individual impact on EPS, and you can't get lower than zero. And you have to imagine, we're just talking about options now. When we have convertible bonds, convertible preferred shares, we're going to have to calculate the change in EPS, and it probably won't be zero, right? It'll be a different change. So we need to know that fact because they're always going to be first in the cascade worksheet when we're calculating the diluted EPS section. All right, so now let's throw some data in here for branch company and see if we can do our cascade worksheet. So now let's assume that branch in the year had net income of 220,000 and an ordinary wax of 100,000. That means the basic EPS to start would have been $2.20 a share. So now when I'm doing my cascade worksheet down here, right, do the worksheet here, what am I going to see? Well, I'm going to set it up as a little worksheet that shows earnings available to common. So what's available to my common shareholders, right? What's the wax I started with and what's the basic EPS? Well here, don't forget, I didn't have any preferred shares, no preferred share dividends declared, no cumulative preferreds. I don't have to worry about that in my numerator. I wanted to clear us of all that so we could focus just on the options, right? That tells me I got a basic EPS of 220 a share. But now I got to look at my diluted EPS, right? What would it be if those options had been exercised? Well, I already proved to you here that if we had exercised those options, it would have made no difference in our numerator, none whatsoever. We would have had a numerator of zero because exercising options has no effect on income and has no effect on preferred share dividends that we would have paid out, right? So that's always going to be zero. We also proved here that we would have issued 5,000 shares if those options were exercised and we would have taken the $75,000 that we would have got on exercise and used it to buy 4,167 shares, meaning that at net we would have issued an extra 833 shares which would now bring our total wax to 100,833 shares if those options had been exercised. Now don't forget, we're still playing what if. We haven't dealt with actual conversions yet. And our earnings available to common would have still stayed at 220000 So now if I take this divided by this guy here, I'm going to get a diluted EPS of $2.18 a share. And if your EPS here cumulatively turns out to be more than 220, then you made a mistake somewhere. You made a mistake in your anti-dilution test perhaps, okay, or maybe it's just a math error here. We don't know, but you got to check it. But diluted EPS should always be less than your basic EPS. So that concludes a short lecture on what diluted EPS is, some of the, and the fact that you have to test each security that's convertible or options that are exercisable to see whether or not they're dilutive and only include those that are dilutive in your diluted EPS calculation. Those three points we covered. We also showed you for options, which is one of the um, items that may be dilutive, right? What the test for dilution is, okay, number one, they got to be in the money, right, in order to be dilutive and if they are, we need to calculate what the change in EPS would be, so we make sure we include them first when we're doing our diluted EPS calculation on the Cascade Worksheet. So I hope you found this hopeful, folks. See you in class.